morning, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Fred Henry. I'm the mayor of the city of South Amboy. And first of all, I'd like to welcome everyone to South Amboy and, uh, and to Teletech, a very important company to the, uh, to the environment here. And it's my pleasure at this time to introduce Congressman Frank Malone, who's going to speak on a very important uh, issue dealing with robocalls. And uh, at this time, Congressman Malone. Thank you, Mayor. I wanted to thank uh, Teltech. I know we're going to have uh, Ethan Gar, who's the, I guess the founder is the best way to just know. Yeah, just one of the guys here. One of the key people for Teltech. I want to thank him for hosting us again. We were here about a year ago when we first started talking about legislation to deal with the one of the global things. And uh, I was amazed when they came in today. I guess I hadn't gone to the second floor last time. Uh, but they've done such a beautiful job of the building. I know the mayor's very proud to have Teltech here and expanding in South Amboy and I. So we really appreciate all you've done. And I, I was telling uh, the Teltech people that when we came last time, I was kind of highlighting the robo killer. Uh, I'm not going to say so much about it today, but I did tell them that over the last year, anytime anybody starts complaining to you about robo calls, I say, well, first of all, we're going to do some legislation. And secondly, if you want to, uh, Really effectively block your robocalls. You know, call Teltech and stop it. It's like constant. And then I tell them how you do what you do with the robots, and they get all excited. Because people, what people love about it is the fact that you're like punishing the robot. They want to go after them like they're the enemy. So, so they love it. But in any case, um, let me just talk a little bit about why why I'm here today. Um, I really believe that even a year ago, when it was last year. Most people saw robocalls and the increased number of robocalls as more of a nuisance than anything else. But I really think that in the last year, um, the atmosphere has changed dramatically. It's no longer a nuisance. People really see it as a threat to the phone system, a threat to public safety, a threat to their health care. And it typified this morning when I was meeting with some people uh, locally in, in Allenhurst, which is also my district. And one of the gentlemen said to me, he said, you know, I don't, I just don't answer the phone anymore. And it's depressing to me because, you know, I used to enjoy answering the phone. It was like a social thing. And, you know, even if it wasn't somebody I knew, you know, somebody maybe wanted to talk to me, but I just don't do it anymore. And, and that's when I, when I say it's a threat to the very phone system, that's what I mean. So many people say, I don't answer the phone. And it may be an important call. It may, I mean, when I say they don't answer the phone, I mean, they don't answer it at all even if their wife is called, because they're afraid that it isn't their wife, right? And so, I mean, it's, it's a threat, because what does that mean? If somebody's trying to reach you, it's an emergency, if it's a health issue, whatever, you don't answer the phone anymore. And that's not a good thing. Now, beyond that, though, it's become a threat to the health system, the public safety system, because of the scammers, right? You know, in other words, we're not talking about, we're not talking about um, if you go to a hospital, I, I actually have an example here with a place that when we had our hearing on this bill, um, we learned that the Moffitt Can Cancer Center in Tampa, Florida, they testified at our hearing on the bill, uh, received 6,600 scam calls in just one month, specifically designed to appear as calls coming from within the hospital. So, you know, a doctor or a nurse gets a call from somebody in the hospital, you know, while they're about to go into an operation or take care of a patient, and it's a scan. And so they say that you know, this is literally a threat to public health. But in addition to that, you get the IRS agents, you get the people who disguise themselves as a policeman or a fireman. I mean, it is completely out of hand. And we had some statistic that just in the 732 area code alone, where we are, consumers receive more than 20 million robocalls in May. That's a little over seven calls per second and more than 27,000 per hour just to the 732 area code. I mean, it's uh, estimated that nearly half of all calls this year in the 732 area code will be scam calls. So, I mean, it's, 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 it's completely out of hand. Um, and, um, you know, for that reason, uh, about in the last six months or so, we worked very hard to, um, to put together uh, legislation, both in the House and the Senate, bipartisan legislation that would try to deal with this issue. And uh, we've been successful, and I want to talk a little bit about the House bill and then tell you what the situation 
is with the Senate bill, because I do believe that the way this is moving, bipartisan in both the House and the Senate, that we can actually get a bill on the President's desk, you know, hopefully uh, before the session ends, uh, maybe by the end of the year or something before the session ends. So, what is it that I'm doing? Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, specifically what we do with our bill. What our bill does, and our bill has already been reported out, I, I guess I should say, I, I chair the Energy and Commerce Committee, which has jurisdiction over telecommunications. And we had a telecommunications and internet subcommittee. This bill's already out of the subcommittee, uh, and we expect to have a markup on the full committee before the end of the month, before the end of July. Basically, it deals with authentication, and what I mean, it, 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 what I mean by that is to make sure that when you get a call, it's actually the person who's calling you, right? So if your wife's calling, and you know, you have an ID, and it says her number, you know it's her, okay? Um, and it goes beyond that, that's the best way. I'm trying to explain this in common sense terms to people that it's very accurate. And then the other thing, it, 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 with carriers that offer a blocking service to a consumer, uh, both the authentication and the blocking service would be, um, would be no charge, right? In other words, we, don't, we have it built into the system so that it's an opt-out situation and there's no charge for the actual uh, blocking or authentication service. We also direct the FCC to issue rules to uh, protect consumers who want to withdraw consent because a lot of times people agree to consent but then they have a hard time withdrawing. The most important thing is the definition. Like people say to me, why have the number of, of um, robocalls increased so much in the last year, the last two years? Part of the reason is because the exemptions have become the norm. There, was, there is legislation on the books, but it's increasingly become meaningless because the exemptions have become so broad and the courts, because you know different companies have gone to court and they basically allow those exemptions definitions to be brought in. So really, essentially, if somebody now is, is, made, is, is doing robocalls, they can essentially say, well, we're exempt. We're exempt, we can do it, right? We're, we're, we're part of the exempted calls. And so the definition reigns that in, so that the very limited exemptions, the redefinition to rein all that in again. Um, the other thing is with regard to enforcement, uh, two aspects. Right now, basically, uh, if, if the FCC or somebody wants to go after uh, the, the bad actor, if you will, um, the statute of limitations is only for a year. This changes into three years and sometimes four. But there's also a very um, cumbersome process. I'm not, not sure if I'm describing it exactly, but the way it works is if the FCC wants to go over after somebody, they have to first notify them, and then if only if they if they if they don't cease their operations, then they can then they can file a complaint against them. But even then, um, it, 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 they have to take so many steps to sort of warn them before they can actually take action. And we've eliminated all those steps when there's a specific intent to defraud. Right. Um, so I think that's another enforcement tool that I wanted to mention. And. Um, I think those are the main things that I wanted to mention, and there's a lot of other things in here. Uh, one of the things that's important, though, is that, and I don't know if I'm describing this well, because we I had a conversation with the teletech uh, people about this. We, we understand that telecommunications is evolving, and there's always innovation, right? So part of what we're trying to do here is to say, okay, we're gonna rein in things, we're gonna deal with the problems that we see today, but we anticipate that, you know, even if we're successful and this bill passes and all the things that I've talked to about put into place, that of course, the industry is such uh, that they'll, over the next five or 10 years, things will start turning around again because people will come up with new ways of getting around everything, and new ways of, you know, being a pain in the ass or whatever the term is. So we also kind of built into this process, giving the FCC the flexibility so that as things change, even with the new rules, that they can go back and, and have the flexibility to, to go after bad actors anyway. Now, how exactly we do that, I can't, but that, that's the idea. Mickey Gross just walked in. Mickey Gross is the council president. He oh, my and, uh, I don't know, he, he's, he's the best too. 
All right. So the only thing, the other thing I wanted to mention is the Senate bill. Uh, I don't want to talk a lot about. It. It's not exactly the same. We think the House bill is better, but that's not the point. We always talk about this stuff. So. Um, but the Senate bill has passed the Senate. The Senate, and, and as I said, we're at a subcommittee. So I, I do want you to understand that we're not just talking about a bill that's introduced or draft. These things are moving, and we do expect that um, once the House passes this bill, uh, that we'll work with the Senate and come up with a, a joint bill that we can pass both houses and bring it over to the President. So I think you're going to stop with that, um, and I want to introduce uh, Ethan Gar. You'll have to tell us what your title is since you refuse to tell me you're the head of Talk Time. <laughs> <laughs> wrong for me to take some of the poor people like El Mayor Cohen, who is the founder of Teltec, uh, to take their thunder. But I am Ethan Gar, I'm, strategic, I'm senior vice president of strategic growth here at Teltec, and we are the makers of RoboKiller. And I'm really excited to tell you that since you were last year, we were acquired by IAC, an IAC company called Mosaic Group. So uh, I don't think I could do a better job of, just, of framing the problem and telling you just sort of where we are with this landscape. So, Congressman Cologne, we're really grateful for you to be here today. Thank you, Mayor Henry. Uh, we really do appreciate you joining us and making Teltec your home once again. As we fight this onslaught of annoying and harassing robocalls that have invaded our phones, we want to express our strong support for HR 3375, the Stopping That Robocalls Act. It's really important legislation, and we're glad that it comes right out of here from the congressman right here in New Jersey, um, and also the chairman of the House uh, Committee on Energy and Commerce. We think it's going to make a significant impact, and we do thank you for your leadership on this issue. RoboKiller is a mobile application that stops these spam calls. It stops them from hitting millions of consumers from this every day, and it also protects against those really dangerous threats that these pose to vulnerable populations. We believe that the best solution to this problem is strong legislation coupled with an innovative solution like, like RoboKiller, and our technology ensures that important calls, emergency calls, important business calls, reach consumers while unwanted calls get blocked. We use audio fingerprinting, machine learning, user feedback, and other technologies to make sure that we're only blocking those unwanted calls. And then, as you mentioned, and we appreciate it, our answer bots then go to work. And these answer bots, they're really hilarious, they're fun, but they also serve an important purpose. Right now, one of these answer bots is answering one of those fake IRS phone scammers and she's telling that scammer that she just accidentally spilled coffee on Marilyn Monroe's dress while visiting the museum. And she'll keep that telemarketer on the phone for maybe 15, 20 minutes, sometimes an hour. And she'll do a really good job of wasting their time. And that's important because while it's certainly entertaining and fun and it is protecting our user, what it's also doing is protecting someone's elderly grandmother from falling victim to one of these scams. So we're really proud of it, and we're proud to be participating in this with you. So Chairman Fulham, again, thanks for doing this. We're glad to be here in New Jersey with you. And uh, you are leading this important fight. And we're looking forward to working with you as we continue to solve this problem. And Say a few words. First is Beverly Brown Ruggio with New Jersey Citizen Action. And I was telling Beverly that not about a month ago, <coughs> a month ago um, we were at a dinner at the Consumer Federation of America, which is different from Consumer Reports, who's here today. Uh, and both of us were honored that I, uh, you know, for what we do, part of it was uh, my role in court legislation, and, uh, and, and Beverly was honored as uh, the activist with Citizen Action. But we didn't realize that, both, that either one of us were being honored. So when we got there, I think there were about like four honorees, and the two of them were New Jersey from the national groups. So we're very proud. Yeah. Proud of New Jersey. Thank you, Congressman. And um, uh, the Congressman received the Phil Hart Award. Uh, Phil Hart is a tremendous uh, icon in Detroit, where I come from. So it's doubly um, special to have him receive that award. 
So I'm here from New Jersey Citizen Action, and I just want to amplify a little bit the numbers that Congressman Pallone uh, mentioned about robocalls here in New Jersey. Uh, in fact, uh, since two, or between 2017 and 2018, um, Umail, which is a company that blocks and tracks robocalls, uh, calculated that uh, there were 48 billion robocalls. That's 1,500 robocalls per second nationwide. So the numbers are even more staggering when you look at the picture across the country. And in fact, this problem has reached epidemic proportions. Um, unfortunately, as Congressman Plum pointed out, current regulations are not protecting consumers enough. Um, and the companies that, that violate existing regulations uh, and are responsible for billions of legal calls are violating our privacy, and they cost the public time and money. We waste time answering or trying to decipher who these calls are from, or we simply do not answer the phone, as the Congressman mentioned. Um, it's impossible to know how many calls uh, we miss that are relevant to our work or to our personal business, including health care, financial transactions, important family matters, uh, matters as the Congressman also mentioned. My mother's 96 years old in Detroit. She does not answer the phone. We have to track her down, asking neighbors to go check on her. It's really quite dangerous uh, in terms of her care. Uh, if a caregiver who's coming to see her can't reach her, she doesn't know that they're not coming, things like that. Um, on you know, on an uh, increasing basis, consumers are uh, being deceived, uh, tricked, and abused with any number of uh, deceptive practices like robocalling. Um, and robocalls render our phone service, which we pay for, uh, half null and void. Uh, in addition to the aggravation and annoyance, robocalls cost us time and money. Uh, and that's the money we pay for for the service. Um, they are, robocalls amount to another form of hidden, not so hidden, I should say, um, cost to all of us, fees and costs. Congressman Pallone's legislation um, will give uh, both the FTC and consumers themselves much better tools to stop robocalls uh, at no extra charge in terms of what your service are supposed to provide. Um, the bill gives consumers greater control over phone accounts, for which we pay, again, um, to update their call blocking preferences. That's very important since new calls, since old calls that we authorize can turn into harassing calls and we need to stop those. Um, the FCC will have greater oversight and enforcement authority and will also uh, be held accountable by Congress for implementation of new regulatory, uh, regulatory requirements. And that's important, as you say, as technology evolves, we're going to have to relook uh, at what, whether this specific legislation is taking care of uh, the problem. Citizen Action commends and thanks Congressman Pallone uh, for introducing legislation to modernize FTCC regulations with a a uh, common sense uh, response to overwhelming and unstoppable invasions into our lives. This bill gives the public the tools we need to stop unwanted, in many cases, illegal and harassing robocalls, which too often we need to manage our personal business. Uh, we miss essential calls uh, and, and uh, are not able to take care of our personal business, as I've said. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing my mother answer the phone in the future. <laughs> once this bill goes through. Um, and we at Citizen Action urge uh, everyone in the public in New Jersey and indeed across this country uh, to contact their legislators and urge them to support this bill. And we certainly hope you can cajole the Senate into doing a stronger bill. So thank you. And then next uh, we have uh, Chuck Bell with Consumer Reports, not the Consumer Federation of America, okay. Consumer Reports. So at Consumer Reports, we've been uh, running a campaign uh, regarding robocalls for the last couple of years. We've had over uh, 750,000 people have uh, signed our petition to end robocalls. And uh, <coughs> consumers are hopping mad about robocalls that ring every hour of the day and night. Uh, so we um, commend Representative Pallone for his leadership in introducing the Stopping Bad Robocalls Act with bipartisan support. Uh, we think this bill will provide consumers with important, much-needed protections in the fight against robocalls. And uh, this is a problem, as we've heard, that has exploded over the last decade. 
Um, consumers are inundated with irritating and harmful messages. Uh, they're particularly damaging to seniors and vulnerable consumers, such as immigrants who are trusting and may be taken in by scams, uh, which run in the hundreds of millions to billions of dollars each year, and even in individual cases could be 5,000, 10,000, as much as 80 or 100,000. Uh, we, we have cases being reported in police around the country, so it's not something just irritating, it's something that's really super harmful uh, to people. Um, this uh, legislation will not only require the phone companies to adopt effective technology to stop the scam calls, it will also help secure strong rules so that consumers can also stop calls from uh, legitimate companies and if they want to withdraw their consent from robocalls from American telemarketing companies, uh, they would be able to do so. Uh, so Representative Palomi, thank you so much for your leadership in introducing this bill and fighting for its passage and also for all you do at the House Energy and Commerce Committee to protect consumers. Uh, we think that when uh, there's a level playing field for consumers, it's good for businesses too because we can all innovate against a common standard, uh, standard and uh, do well in our economy. Thank you. And last, we have Crystal McDonald, who represents AARP of New Jersey. Obviously, more seniors complaining about robocalls than many other people for obvious reasons. So, thank you for being here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Thank you for having me. Um, this is an incredibly important day, and AARP applauds Representative Cologne's bipartisan leadership in addressing the serious problem of illegal and unwanted robocalls. The Stopping Bad Robocalls Act will help protect seniors and all Americans from fraud and finally crack down on fraudulent robocalls that have plagued older Americans for years. In the last week alone, I've received spoofing calls from my own number, scamming calls claiming that my social security number has been compromised, and it's my job to know that these are coming, and my heart still skips a beat every single time um, until I realize, oh yes, this is a scam call. Um, and we really need to put a stop to this. AARP has a long history of fighting for protections for older Americans. Through our nationwide Fraud Watch Network initiative, we work to empower consumers to spot and avoid scams and provide support and guidance to victims and their families when fraud happens, and then advocate for policy change. The impact of these calls is financially and emotionally devastating, costing unsuspecting consumers billions of dollars each year. And it's especially hard hitting for older Americans who are particularly vulnerable um, to bone, victim, um, bone victimization, which can wipe out their life savings. AARP is very encouraged by the Stopping Bad Robocalls Act, which has the potential to diminish illegal robocalls, a rich playground for scammers to deceive victims into paying money under false pretense. All Americans will benefit from the provisions of the Act and promote an accurate call authentication framework and prevent consumers from being charged with blocking technology. AARP believes that the law will reduce the number of robocalls and associated um, uh, fraud that occurs with them. So we really thank you again, Congressman Pallone, um, for your work on this important issue, and we look forward to continuing to work with you and your colleagues on a bipartisan basis to com combat unwanted and abusive robocalls against older Americans. Thank you, Crystal. Any questions from the media? Here, go ahead. Hi. Uh, I know that Senator Menendez's bill has a $10,000 per call penalty. Is that something that's also in the House bill? You know, I'm assuming that the um, that the Senate bill that we're talking about is the same as, as oh, okay. Menendez. I think it is. Um, I don't. I I don't know offhand. I, I I'm trying not to get into too much. You know, we always think we have a better bill in the House, but I don't want him to hear that. So. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think of the idea of a penalty, though? What'd you say? A penalty. The concept of a penalty. Yeah, I think you're right. I think that um, I think that uh, it does have a higher penalty in the Senate. I believe that's true. Okay. So, but I don't know exactly. And another question: um, At this point, Verizon, AT and T, and T-Mobile all offer free services that will block and, for example, label a call that it's that it's a spam or a scam call. Uh, I think. T-Mobile uses Hiya, AT&T uses first Orion, and Verizon uses TNS. They kind of source it out to another another group. But is this something that's, uh, is this what you're talking about in the bill when you're saying you want carriers to do this? Are they already doing it? 
Well, I, the answer is yes, but understand that, uh, and if I'm wrong, you can kind of correct me. But I do want to get away from the idea, you know, I think that what's happening now is that as they see this, these bills moving in the House and the Senate, a lot of the carriers, or some of the carriers, are saying, well, we don't need legislation because we can do this on our own. And we applaud the fact that they're moving in that direction, but we also do not believe that we can stop uh, from moving the bill. Because as you know, in this world, in any industry, there's always the good actors and there's the bad actors. And so I, I would encourage Verizon and others to you know, follow what we're asking, but on the other hand, it's not gonna mean that we're not gonna move forward because there are always gonna be bad actors and we, we can't operate on the assumption that everybody's gonna be the good guy. But if you want to add, sure, I just wanna say as advocates, we would like to see practices codified. Um, as you said, you know, voluntary uh, practices are good. Um, but we need some standards, and we need them to be enforced. So uh, we would say that it's great for them to do that, and they can probably help with the technological changes and advances, and maybe they want to re report to Congress and, and speak at hearings about their experiences in their own companies, but uh, advocates would ask that this, these practices be codified by law. You know, it's, it, it, in all honesty, not to belabor the point, but it's true in everything we do, right? So for example, we were talking to Teltech before about how we're doing comprehensive privacy legislation. And to some extent, that's a response to you know, some of the bad things that have been happening with Facebook and, and other you know, companies in Silicon Valley. And so you know, they'll say, well, we're doing this on our own. We don't need legislation. But I don't buy it because, again, although the legislation oftentimes will move good actors to do the right thing, there are always going to be those who don't. So that's why I think we need has taken some actions, I think, on authentication, right? Yeah. But it's very, it's, it, it's minimal. I mean, most of the things that I articulated to you are not being done by the FCC. I think it's, it's, it's evident in the fact that in March, um, the FCC had to uh, go after, I don't know how many companies it was, but they've had to step up in their um, enforcement actions because companies are working around and getting past the current existing regulations, and I think as someone said earlier, it's really about making sure that Congress is on top of evolving technology, and so um, right, current, as I said, current regulations just aren't sufficient, so whether, and the FCC has to be able to be flexible, as you said, and move with uh, technology, which as we know is um, advancing rapidly every day. And I, and when I said, I think I was saying FCC, FTC. FTC. I it, is the, it is the FTC. FTC? I'm it sorry. is the FTC. Oh, you said FTC. I think I said FTC. FTC. Anybody else want to comment on any of these? All right. Anybody else want to ask a question? It could be the audience, too, if you like. No? All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you to Teltech. And what's the new company? I know I should have said it. Uh, it's the Mosaic Group. We're part of IAC. IAC. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate all you do. Thanks so much.